is 9 a.m. PST, and I understand it's uh, 6 p.m. in Switzerland, where our speaker today is from, and he is Bukhar Becher that is uh, here with us today. And he will be introduced by one of the co-organizers, uh, Matteo Iannacone. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. And it gives me great pleasure today to introduce my friend, uh, Burkhard Becher. Burkhard was born in Cologne, Germany, where he studied biology and specialized in molecular genetics and biochemistry. In 1995, uh, for his uh, PhD studies, he went to uh, the Montreal Neurological Institute at McGill University in Canada, in Jack and Pell's lab, to train in neuroimmunology. There, his work focused on the role of microglia in extracting uh, self-reactive T cells in the context of autoimmune neuroinflammation. In 1999, he joined uh, Randy Noel's lab at the Dartmouth uh, Medical School to extend his work to in vivo models and transgenic mice. In 2003, he was recruited as an assistant professor to the neurology department at the University Hospital of Zurich where he quickly rose to the ranks, and in 2008, he became full professor and chairman at the Institute of Experimental Immunology at the University of Zurich, where he also heads the Unit for Inflammation Research. And those are positions that he still holds uh, today. Throughout his independent career, Burkett has continued to define the cytokine network in inflammation, particularly in the central nervous system in the context of autoimmune diseases, but also lately neurodegeneration and cancer. Burkhardt has made tremendous contribution to the field of immunology. For example, he redefined the role of the cytokine GMCSF, initially thought of as a hematopoietic growth factor, as a critical molecule produced by uh, tissue invading uh, lymphocytes that acts on myeloid cells to promote inflammation. That discovery shifted Burkhardt's attention more and more to the role of myeloid cells in neuroinflammation. For his work, Burkhardt has received numerous awards and prizes, uh, just to mention a few, an ERC advance grant, the Max Cloeta Award, the Robert Bean Prize. He sits on several scientific advisory boards, uh, grant review panels, and editorial boards. Burkhardt, we are very honored to have you with us today and look forward to your talk entitled GMCSF, Communication Conduit Between Lymphocytes and Myelid Cells in Inflammation. Mille grazie, Matteo. Thank you so much, um, uh, both of you, Elina and Matteo, for having me. Matteo, thanks for the wonderful introduction. I'm really, really pleased to be here in my home office. <laughs> I wish I were. <laughs> I wish we could all get together right now, but apparently we have to wait a little bit longer. We just were announced that Switzerland in 2022, uh, by the summer, will have a new batch of vaccines. So we're, uh, we're good to go. It doesn't take that much longer. So there's an end inside. I'm, I'm truly thrilled to be here and to share some of the work that we've been doing. And I, I guess I, I hand back to you while I'm preparing my presentation. Yeah, I forgot to mention that Burkhard is a very entertaining speaker. <laughs> so, so before we start, Burkhard, um, uh, we always ask a question to our uh, speakers in order to know them better. And the question we would like to ask you is, which scientist has inspired you the most in your career and why? Yeah. I, you know what, I wrecked my brain around this. I really thought like, what am I going to, what am I going to say? Because I wanted to say something, you know, it should be a living immunologist, obviously, or maybe somebody who passed away, or maybe one of the main founders of immunology, like a Pasteur, Koch, you know, Ehrlich, all these things are, are all, all these guys are very impressive. Then I thought that maybe I go to Newton or Madame Curie or, or any of these, but to, to tell you the truth, the scientists that inspired me the, the most, you've mentioned their names already, were my former supervisors. And the reason is not because I thought their research was the most inspiring science in the world. Surely they're, they're good scientists, but the most important thing, I actually thought they were really, really nice um, and knew how to, to run a team, manage a team and be, you know, not necessarily only driven by their egos, but really more about doing good science together, having fun together, and, and shaping a, a research team that likes working together. And I, um, when I'm a grown-up, I, I want to I wanna be like them, because I really thought they did a great job in that regard. And, and that, to be quite honest, even though it's not the most exciting answer, is in truth who had inspired me the most. No, I totally agree. Thank you very much, Borja. So 
Um, I think you can share your screen. Mm -hmm. I'll see oh. that this would work now. You can see everything. Perfect. And very good. OK, so once again, I'm excited to be here. And I'll talk, uh, as Matteo already mentioned today, I'd like to talk about uh, GMCSF with you. And um, but before I start, since, since you know, I know who Newton was. And, and not that I know much about astrophysics. But I like to bring this slide as an analogy um, to the immune system. There is, you know, all of you probably know a little bit about astrophysics, the idea of a Big Bang, this expansion of the universe. The universe is racing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day. And uh, the question is, will it continue growing or will there be a maximum expansion and then a, 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 a condensation? So do we get uh, the universe closing again, ending up in another singularity and the end of everything? Um, and it's not that this is a subject that interests me so much, but I thought it's a good analogy to understanding T cells. Uh, and I think the Big Bang for T cell polarization happened in 1986. And ever since then, we are still thinking about the, the, the reality that helper T cells come obviously in somewhat different flavors. And initially, um, uh, Tim uh, Mossman and Bob Kaufman described these Th1 and Th2 cells, with Th1 cells making predominantly interferon gamma, Th2 cells predominantly making IL-4. There's this history, but it changed the way we think about immune response. As we talk about type 1 immunity, dominated usually by intracellular pathogens, and then type 2 immunity by extracellular pathogens. In the context of autoimmunity, people then, uh, or tissue inflammation, this was one, basically when I started immunology, big debate as to tissue inflammation is primarily Th1 or Th2 mediated, and then a lot of confusion started because there seems to be a difference between a helper T cell and a cytokine. And so this T cell universe got bigger and bigger. I just found this, this I basically took off of, 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 of Google. And now we have all kinds of other cells, like Th9 cells, Th17, 22, et cetera. And they're all, and, and you know, and then I, I, I found just um, this morning, I had a quick browse again, and I found this, this um, review article, which I thought was really, really good, actually. But you can see here, there's multifurcations in the Th17, you know, uh, X Th70, Th117, Th17, pathogenic, non-pathogenic, those that make IL-22, et cetera. And when it comes down to it, a while back, our lab started getting into using high dimensional cytometry um, to look for multiple cytokines. And it turns out the more cytokines you're looking at, the more messy it gets. It doesn't become more unifying. But there are some patterns that emerge, and I think I'd like to share this with you. It's something we are putting together with a bunch of friends of mine. The idea that maybe we should think about that there's a, the contraction of a T cell universe, and maybe think about that um, there are overall flavors which have to do with the fact that what is T cell help? So, for instance, type one response is usually meant to trigger activity in macrophages and dendritic cells. Type 2 response, as we know, it's in B cells, eosinophils, mast cells, and what have you. And type 3 responses usually drive, um, uh, for instance, if it's, if it's an overreaching Th3 response, you see tissue inflammation, epithelial inflammation, because this is the primary target of these helper T cells. And, and, and within these, there are, of course, multiple different specializations. But there is much more flexibility uh, uh, once you have committed to the kind of cell you want to talk to. So I like the idea of classifying T cells on the type of help that they, that they provide and not the molecules, transcription factors, cytokines, extracellular molecules, uh, 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 um, et cetera, that, that, you, that, that they find them. Because that, that seems to be almost no end to the diversity. And this seems to me attractive. And with this, I start with the work of, of these two guys. This is Florian and Edu, who were wondering what is the flavor of the signature in multiple sclerosis? And it's a question that's been asked for a long, long time. We didn't reinvent the wheel here. We just thought we just ask it again and use different methodology. And the methodology in this case was to sample um, peripheral blood and nucleated cells from patients that are suffer from multiple sclerosis or non-inflammatory neurological diseases or from other inflammatory diseases. And so those then are barcoded and Florian specifically worked very hard on getting a barcoding scheme together that we can have multiples of a hundred, so that we can always look at hundred 
different samples simultaneously. And then, you know, this, this particular one is using CYTOF, where we looked at, you know, as you can see, a lot of cytokines, chemokine receptors, et cetera, altogether all 84 parameters in the panel. And then they use what we call algorithm guided analysis, which is no longer novel. Everybody does that now. But this one is maybe pretty cool. It's called Cell CNN. It's an algorithm our team really likes because it, it does not just look for what's different in the mean expression between the different molecules, but uh, between the different samples. Um, but instead, it takes into account that they are co-expressed by a certain cell. So it's a, it's a neural network based algorithm that looks for patterns that are coming from cellular populations, which may be unique to a particular uh, condition, in this case, multiple sclerosis. And, you know, without going into too much detail, um, just um, let me just make sure I get the laser pointer going. We find the population right here. This is the cell CNN population on the entire map of leukocytes. And they happen to be actually CD4 positive T cells, which was rather rewarding because, I mean, um, we were, 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 they are one of the suspect cells in multiple sclerosis, let's put it this way. Um, it's, it's enriched in multiple sclerosis rather clearly, and the signature of these cells, they are producing uh, interferon gamma and GMCSF. They also produce IL-2 and TNF-alpha, and they make the chemokine receptor um, CXCR4, and they're enriched in multiple sclerosis specifically, not in other inflammatory or non-inflammatory diseases. So it's really in, in CIS stands for clinically isolated syndrome, which is prodromal stage of MS. And this is where we see this increase. And here, basically, you see, oh, it doesn't matter, I can skip this. It's just a, a different way of displaying the cell population. And as we are putting this together, we're asking ourselves now, is this, is this actually um, the signature? Is this pathologically relevant? And that's, this you cannot answer in, in, in humans. You can, you can gauge it a little bit better than what we've done so far, but you can't really answer it clearly. One thing that we, what we could do was we had access to um, cerebral spinal fluid. Now the cerebral spinal fluid is the kind of the juice that our brains swim in. And um, they usually, that is a relatively clean, sterile uh, uh, liquid that doesn't have a lot of cells intrinsically in them under normal healthy conditions. But when you suffer from MS, you will find leukocytes invading uh, the brain and therefore also they can be found in the cerebral spinal fluid. And as you can see here, it is this particular population that is dramatically enriched in the brain. And um, in terms of, uh, is this, are they a target of any specific drug? I doubt it. But if you lose, if you, if you get better uh, under a certain condition, in this case, we used uh, dimethyl fumarate, uh, the patients were, were treated with that. And these are matched data, individual patients before and after the therapy, the number of signature cells disappears from the blood. It's, it goes away. And that happened in basically every patient that was a responder. It does not work in the non-responders. Again, it does not mean that this is the disease driving population, but it certainly is a pretty good biomarker in our hands at this point. Now, a little bit closer to the question as to whether this is more than just a biomarker and whether the particular signature that we observe in multiple sclerosis is actually disease relevant, we have to do this experiment in mice. And uh, to test this, I'm focusing, I mean, obviously interferon gamma, I'm, I'm pushing it. It's a little bit of hyperbole, but, but GMCSF seemed to pop up for us. And so we thought might as well uh, talk quickly more about this molecule, as Matteo said, uh, was initially thought to be a colony stimulating factor. And um, I, I want to assure you, it just isn't a colony stimulating factor because in the steady state in, in healthy individuals, uh, he healthy mammals, and we're looking primarily at mice, we know that it's produced at very low levels in the lungs uh, to form alveolar macrophages. It's the only macrophage population that we know today that requires GMCSF for their genesis and for uh, their survival, so their maintenance. It has a minor effect on, on CD103 positive DCs across epithelial tissues, but it is not at all required for the formation or the maintenance of conventional dendritic cells, of macrophages, or of granulocytes. Hence, uh, GMCSF is not a granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor at all. In inflammation, 
And the primary source, we'll get to this in a later part of this presentation, but the primary source is debated. Um, we know that it can be triggered through the, act, uh, the action of interleukin-23 in T cells. Um, uh, we know that GMCSF in the context of, of brain inflammation activates the transition of monocytes into inflammatory tissue macrophages. And we found out that it's not only in the brain that this molecule seems to have this important role of communicating between an active inflammatory T cell and its executive arm the monocyte derived, let's say, macrophage. Um, but to model dysregulated GMCSF in mice, what Sabine Spath, who was a PhD student in the lab did, she basically um, made a system in which the um, expression, in, in which it's a knock-in into uh, the ROSA26 locus of this construct. And upon Cree recombination, in this case, she used a CD4 Cree ER. So upon the addition of tamoxifen, the stop cassette is excised and a strong promoter will drive the expression of GMCSF and a green fluorescent protein exclusively in CD4 positive T cells in the periphery. And now I have to turn off the laser pointer just to go back to this. And what she observed, it took a long time for this to occur. In the beginning, we thought there was no phenotype, but there is a phenotype and that I share with you quickly. So the mice, uh, after about 10 weeks or so, become very, very sick uh, and have to be uh, sacrificed more or less immediately because uh, they obviously have a fundamental problem in their central nervous system. And um, what is the CNS phenomenon that we observe here? Again, it happens in mice relatively late, starting at about 10 weeks or so, with a penetrance of virtually 100%. These mice develop neuroinflammation and it's dominated by these rotatory phenotypes. So it's not classical EAE, but more of a rotatory phenotype. Um, and what was observed then is that we see inflammation in brainstem, cerebellum, in the meninges and in the spinal cord. And without going to all the details here, because I want to load a lot of stuff onto you right now, you see this uh, influx, um, you see the, the inflammatory influx of these monocyte derived cells. So monocytes are prominent invader into the CNS. And you can see here, they're actually not just invading, they also start eating tissue. They're eating myelin and they're packed with, uh, they look like foam cells, they're packed with myelin. And they are by far the most prominent infiltrate. Just to summarize what this shows here, and I hope I'll keep the, 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 the red line here, um, is that the GMCSF secretion, in this case, we force the secretion. It's, a, it's an experimental artifact that, that I'm presenting here. This is not a, a disease model per se, um, but it's an experimental artifact where the overproduction of GMCSF to mimic what we see in in MS, the overproduction of GMCSF in T cells leads to a more or less blind expansion of inflammatory myeloid cells, which invade numerous tissues, uh, primarily lung, liver, kidney, but also the central nervous system. But only in the CNS do these cells start to make um, uh, change completely their phenotype, start eating, they have phagocytosin, they produce interleukin-1 reactive oxygen species, and what have you, whereas in the other tissues that are, they, these monocytes visit, like the lung, the liver, and the kidney, we do not see tissue damage and immunopathology whatsoever. Mind you, without going into detail here, I should tell you that this has nothing to do with autoimmunity in the sense that you need a T or B cell receptor to recognize the autoantigen, because you do not need a T cell receptor at all in this whole context. So these T cells can recognize ovalbumin and they will cause the exact same disease as you can see here. So the take home message that I'd like to bring, and I actually, I, this sometimes is very contentious, people don't necessarily like the idea, but there is some good, precedence and more and more people are thinking about this, that you can get um, tissue specific inflammation in the absence of classic T cell driven TCR recognition of a self antigen simply by dysregulating cytokines. So a cytokinopathy that can be observed with IL-17 leads to psoriasiform inflammation. It's been super well documented in mice and in humans. Uh, this is what happens. And blocking this one cytokine has a tremendous effect to stop inflammation in a tissue specific manner. TNF has long been known, the overexpression of TNF has long been shown to be uh, driving joint and synovial inflammation. And we here show you that yes, GMCSF can also lead 
and dysregulation of GMCSF leads to neuroinflammation. It's still autoimmunity in the bigger sense in that you have immunopathology, but it's not, uh, we do not require here a, a, a self-antigen at all. So this functions completely independent of that. And obviously we are rather fascinated by, by, by GMCSF and I, I would like to share the work now of, um, this is progressing now, I'm stay, still staying with GM of uh, Juliana and Selma. So on the left, the Selma, on the right, it's Juliana and uh, the collaborators I mentioned below. And they decided, uh, we all decided together to make a fate map and reporter of GMCSF. This, we started this project with Juliana a very long time ago. And um, the idea was to introduce into the GMCSF locus, this uh, construct with a, uh, an improved Cree recombinase uh, uh, you know, uh, ribosomal entry site and GFP. Um, and again, um, when you knock this into the CSF locus, this is what it would look like. The, uh, the CSF2 promoter, when it is active, would drive two molecules simultaneously, namely Cre and GFP. So the cells will, that make GMCSF will be green and they will produce Cre. So we called these mice FAPEMAP and reporter of GMCSF. And because it's too long, we found an acronym that we like, we call it FROG. And I've presented this, this, this sort of work, but there's some, some, some interesting updates lately. So the FROG mouse line, I show here these frogs. This is not because we're working with frogs. It's just uh, basically just to, 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 to find a cute image of these mice that we manipulated here. So the frog mouse, again, when it makes GMCSF will turn, the cells that make it will turn green. So that was crossed with a fate mapping system. So in which when the Cree recombinase is active in the cell, will excise the stop cassette permanently and the cells will that made GMCSF will turn red. So what we have is a cell that makes GMCSF will always be red and green. And when it stops making GMCSF, it will remember that it made it and will always stay red. So the X GMCSF cells will stay red. Today, I will not go into the epigenome of these cells and that there is a strong stab stable phenotype. We have an update to this project. It's quite exciting for us. But the GMCSF uh, producing cells, even when they cease to do so, will remember to do this for a very, very, very long time. So they're quite stable. So, and there is a huge debate as to what are the actual cellular sources of GMCSF during neuroinflammation. There are numerous reports on this, not just neuroinflammation, but inflammation in general. And um, so when you look at the lymph node uh, in, in early EAE, so just after immunization with the autoantigen and uh, a massive amount of, 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 of dirt in the form of com complete Freund's adjuvant, what you see is in fact the expression of GMCSF across the NK cells, um, CD8 positive and gamma delta T cells, and really a, a, a not a very bright uh, expression um, in CD4 T cells. Here you see the actual GMCF, GMCSF expression in this moment. However, when we looked in the brain, and this was very rewarding indeed, we find influx into the brain by CD4 and CD8 T cells, but only the CD4 T cells maintain GMCSF expression. And that is in all likelihood because they recognize their autoantigen. CD8 T cells do not recognize their MHC class two antigen, um, which is what we use to immunize the mice, but the CD4 compartment will recognize it. So we think that these red green cells are actually the ones that just recognize their antigen and actively produce GMCSF in the central nervous system. Now, the fact that we, the mice, that the cells that produce GMCSF also make Cre allows us to do a lot of different tricks. And again, I will not show you everything here, just that when, how do, what happens if you just ablate the cells, the few red green cells I showed you earlier, if you get rid of the, the, um, the cells that make GMCSF. So we used um, the, we crossed the frog mouse with the Rosa 26 DTA. So here the diphtheria toxin A is produced the moment that Cre is produced because you excise the stop cassette again. And so these GMCSF expressing cells will commit immediate suicide. So they will start making GMCSF and then they'll make DTA and then they die. So they can't, they can't be maintained. And that actually has a major effect on disease development. As you can see, they get some level of disease development, but this never escalates into anything. 
what we thought was actually the most the more this is not really surprising to me but this is somewhat more surprising when you look at um, T cell invasion in these mice, you would expect that here in these healthier mice, you see fewer T cells uh, compared to those much sicker mice. And the answer is no, you don't. There's no difference in T cell invasion. There is, however, a rather dramatic difference in the number of monocyte derived cells. Uh, and th throughout the presentation, I don't know really why I didn't check this more carefully. We use different names for these cells. But right now, let's stick to monocyte or inflammatory or tissue invading monocyte derived cells. Um, all right, so the other thing that I'd like to share here with you, and this is this is the work is out there, but what is nice is the fact that when we get rid of the GMCSF expressing cells, the other cells that go in are of the, what you traditionally call Th1 and Th17 persuasion. So you have an expansion of IL-17 producing cells. You have an expansion of interferon gamma producing cells. This, on the other hand, does not cause disease. So you, don't, you can make as much interferon gamma and GMCSF in the brain as, uh, and IL-17 in the brain as you like. This does not drive the disease. And maybe I alert you to a paper that uh, will come out very shortly uh, by the Weismann Group in Science Immunology explaining the role of IL-17 in neuroinflammation and finally putting an end to this discussion and explaining precisely what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, so just to take home message here of this part is that the inflammation, tissue inflammation is actually pretty much always dominated by myeloid rather than lymphoid cells. We know that GMCSF is able to license monocytes to mediate immunopathology, and this is vague. This is not a very precise uh, uh, sentence, but it somehow still the most correct that it I, we could come up with. The loss of these cells, in spite of the expansion of interferon gamma and IL-17 producing cells, does stop brain inflammation. And I didn't talk about the cytokines that regulate that. It's not that important. The stuff from now on is exclusively uh, unpublished work. And uh, I'd like to share it with you because I, I think it's, 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 it's still in the theme of what I'm presenting here today. What regulates the pathogenic monocyte to phagocyte transition? So what, wh how does it work that a monocyte behaves different in, it's in, in this GMCSF uh, overexpressing model I showed you earlier? how monocytes behave so different when they invade the liver versus the brain and, and, and what makes that difference or what is driving monocytes to become, to, to contribute to immunopathology and inflammation. And this is, you know, as, as Matteo mentioned, um, wasn't really initially within my comfort zone, but I've been fascinated more and more by, by monocytes. So as you all know, without much detail here, and I stole the slide from, from Anna. Oh, did I mention so I'm, I'm sorry, on the left, this is Anna. On the right, this is Donatella. So Anna uh, uh, made this, the, the slide here for me. And, and you know that monocytes, you know, young monocytes can leave the bone marrow, uh, circulate in the blood in two different flavors, the Lysic-C high, Lysic-C low. But we look at these Lysic-C high ones because they can also uh, invade tissues. And these are the ones that we know are causing immunopathology in the brain. So we have T cells invading that make interferon gamma, they make GMCSF. These are the most prominent cytokines that we see. Um, and somehow it happens that monocytes then develop into tissue in, you know, causing immunopathology, but they come in these two different flavors that have been described. On the one hand, you have the monocyte-derived dendritic cell, and then you have the monocyte-derived macrophage. And it's still not clear whether it is the same precursor that delivers these two states, whether there's another precursor in there, or even more so, are these actually two different uh, endpoints, or are they just transitional states? So do you become one and then the other? Like, uh, is this an intermediate? Uh, state or not. And just for the purpose of nomenclature, we call these monocyte derived dendritic cells for now. It's just a functional term for the study, not necessarily that I, that, that, that what, what I think about these two populations or what we want to conclude, but we figured we give them the name based on other studies that were done before ours. And here it would be that the monocyte derived dendritic cells are primarily MHC positive, MHC class two positive, whereas these inflammatory macrophages will also express MERTK in addition to MHC class two. That's the definition made by others. And we uh, adapted that because it's actually a, a very convenient one. 
And the next thing we needed is a fate mapping system to fate map monocytes. And we, um, uh, a few years back, created a CCR2 CREER, it was Andy Croxford in the lab, uh, CCR2 CREER RT2 mouse uh, that was crossed here again with a fate mapping reporter, in this case, A14, which is uh, tomato. And we know that uh, after two uh, shots of tamoxifen, after two uh, uh, double exposure to tamoxifen, we see the expression of, um, uh, of the reporter in uh, the majority of the of monocytes, um, and uh, but we also see some expression in pre disease, and then we enriched this. We thought might as well in for a penny, in for a pound, might as well do twice the work and have uh, the same data. Uh, we also uh, got the mice from Florent Ginou, the MS four A three CRE. Uh, across to the reporter where we are basically already labeling GMP uh, uh, and have a pretty strong, this is not a CREER based system, but we have a, a very high labeling in, in monocytes again as well. And before I go into the details, what you will, may appreciate or what I, you have to just believe me, the data are virtually overlapping that we got from that. So what was done next is that these two mouse reporter fate mapping systems were used to induce experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis through the immunization with uh, self so mock peptide and, and complete Freund's adjuvant. And then the mice were again harvested, uh, both lymph nodes and brains, which are the most relevant tissues in this context, um, uh, early after immunization or at onset or at peak disease. Uh, and then we specifically looked at the tomato labeled cells, so the monocyte progeny at these different time points during inflammation. And uh, using numerous different methods of high dimensional cytometry, using again CYTOF, using uh, at, at this point, this is uh, PMT based uh, uh, flow cytometry. Now we do most of the experiments with uh, spectral uh, flow cytometry uh, together with CYTOF. And, um, Right. So I, again, without, I know this is very, very much in fashion to show all the different uh, features that we've seen, but I think it's quite overwhelming uh, when we look at all the different markers. Let me just show you the ones that mattered to us the most that gave this a little direction in this UMAP here. So down here you have the uh, MHC class to negative, medium, and high, and this is 64 and Murty K. And we did this with all the different markers. And what we really see is that uh, non-immunized Mice, you know, you have predominated by, by, by monocytes during disease onset in the central nervous system. We have these cells that are have been called MODCs or so monocyte derived dendritic cells. And later stages at disease, we see this accumulation of monocyte derived macrophages. And we just use the simple slingshot analysis to ask ourselves as to whether we have a perfect bifurcation here or whether there's a transitional phase. This is not the final experiment, there's some additional data to support the idea that monocytes go through this stage of upregulating MHC class two, so becoming these MODCs, but then in the tissue, in the inflamed tissue in particular, much more so than in the lymph node, in the inflamed central nervous system, they settle as monocyte derived macrophages. So that's our interpretation of the data so far, here summarized in these colorful uh, slides. Um, but when you're doing this, you can also, this is not really a big surprise to any of us, but the question is that I wanted to ask and that I tried to introduce earlier is like, how is that working? So who regulates that? And I've, I've leaned, I've made the whole presentation look that way already. The two most important cytokines that are in this type one uh, T cell uh, that are capable of interacting with monocytes and with other myeloid cells are indeed GMCSF and interferon gamma. And interferon gamma is the first one that comes to mind because we know interferon gamma regulates MHC expression, but we don't really know what GMCSF really does in vivo to these cells. And there's the next problem and how we circumvent this, I'll show you in, in, in just a second. The next problem we're having is that GMCSF deficient mice and GMCSF receptor deficient mice are EAE resistant. So it's very difficult to study the role of the monocyte to phagocyte transition 
in the GMCSF knockout mouse or receptor knockout mouse simply because there is no monocytophagocyte transition to speak of because there's no brain inflammation. So we can't study it in these mice. Equally and paradoxically, mice that lack interferon gamma or the interferon gamma receptor are not just fully susceptible to EAE, they get much sicker. They are much more susceptible to EAE. So this we could potentially use, but we really wanted to know what these two cytokines make and we want to have an equal playing field. And to achieve that, we just basically did something relatively simple. We made bone marrow chimeras with a mixed input of wild type and GMCSF receptor knockout bone marrow. And we made sure this was equal. And we did the same thing with wild type before the interferon gamma receptor. So we have in the same mouse monocytes that can sense and do not sense GMCSF and monocytes that can sense and do not sense the interferon gamma. And that means all these mice we know will develop EAE because they are quite normalized and equalized. But we can now ask the question, is GMCSF important for the invasion into the brain? Or is interferon gamma important for the migration of monocytes or other things like that? And uh, because we start with an equal, with an equal uh, amount of monocytes or of, of, of blood cells in, in of both persuasions, the interferon gamma GMCSF receptor recognizing uh, cells and the ones that don't recognize it. So now we can let the, have them compete during EAE. So this was done. We let them compete during EAE. I show you now what happens uh, at, um, at, at the peak of disease. We're looking specifically at the monocyte derived cells here in this UMAP. And you will appreciate that these here, whether the T cells, so first of all, there's no difference in invasion. So whether you do or do not sense interferon gamma or GMCSF, monocytes will find their way into the brain quite, uh, quite crisply. It's a different story for CCR2, which I won't get into here, but these two cytokines do not regulate brain invasion or tissue invasion of these monocytes. And the other thing that we found striking is, here isn't a big difference between wild type and GMCSF receptor knockout um, uh, monocytes and monocyte derived cells. Now, given that you cannot get EAE without the GMCSF receptor, it is rather striking to see here that phenotypically we can barely distinguish them. Here, the interferon gamma receptor, on the other hand, really, if, if that's not present, even though we know that it doesn't matter for disease in, uh, induction, it makes it even worse, but the the transition of monocytes into a tissue phagocyte, a monocyte to phagocyte transition in the tissue is basically halted. The phenotypic changes are no longer happening. So it's not, it's not working. Now, this is on the one hand, very rewarding. On the other hand, super frustrating because I wanted to talk about GMCSF and not about interferon gamma. We know interferon gamma is needed for SCA1, class two and all these molecules, but what does GMCSF do to these monocytes? And so, even though I really tried to avoid it, um, we decided to go for single cell sequencing here because we figured this is a, a problem that cannot be addressed in any other way. We needed to go and find additional targets to the ones that we thought about already. And here, we, in the end, this is a perfect example where single cell RNA-seq is super, super useful uh, to identify new targets. And, and we were rewarded with a really beautiful, rich data set. And here you can see basically with the naked eye that there is a fundamental difference between a wild type monocyte, a monocyte that can see GMCSF and a monocyte that is not able to see GMCSF, mainly in the shape of these, uh, of these UMAPs. And this is basically surat based clustering. So I'm not a huge fan of like, how many clusters we, we are here. I think this is clearly over clustered, but this is not important right now. What is important is that we see a disappearance of, of basically these three clusters. M567 is no longer making it in the absence of GMCSF uh, recognition by monocytes. So this doesn't work anymore. And I'm basically close to the end right now. We found that really, really glad to say that we found uh, the majority of the genes in these three clusters are important for phagocytosis, as you can see here, for the activity of the inflammasome, and for the genesis uh, of reactive oxygen species, or also the, the blocking of reactive, or the, the digestion of reactive oxygen species, or, or preventing uh, oxidative stress, those are also involved here. So it's phagocytosis, inflammation, 
and, and redox homeostasis. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing is, this is single cell RNA sequencing. It's purely descriptive. We ask the same. So the question that was asked uh, was, 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 was uh, thrown at us. Uh, was that, is there some actual biology in the RNA seq data? And so this spurned um, Anna on to find the biology. And we said these are the three targets we're interested in: the production of and on the single cell level. Once again, so she looked at pro IL one beta. It's, it's reduced uh, quite dramatically. The production of of reactive oxygen species is decreased, and the ability and this is in vitro here the ability to phagocytosis also reduced. Now. I'd like to summarize this quickly and by saying it's, it's no longer really work in progress. This is pretty much concluded and we know a little bit more about uh, based on, uh, on analysis of RNA velocity and other tools of pseudo time alignment that what we think is happening here is that monocytes which are capable of sensing these, these molecules and tissue inflammation, they go into these tissues that's driven primarily through CC, uh, CCR2 um, engagement they then uh, change the phenotype, upregulate MHC, and become monocyte-derived dendritic cells. Those are often and more dominantly found in the draining lymph nodes, where obviously MHC serves a function. And um, in the monocyte, but when they enter the brain, there's still this transition from MODC into this monocyte-derived macrophage, which will then, in the presence of GMCSF, be capable of producing these reactive oxygen species, release lots of IL-1 beta, so many of the cells will basically die, and uh, but they will also phagocytose. And that's basically a phenomenon that we observed here, and we're quite pleased that we could resolve this. Now, how's my time doing here? Okay, so uh, if you don't mind, bear with me for another six, seven minutes, and then I, I, I will let you go, because so in fashion and everybody, I, I was quite jealous when everybody was working on COVID and, and, and we didn't make much progress there because Switzerland during the first wave looked really, really good in COVID. So we didn't have a lot of patients. But luckily, I, I have some friends from all over uh, Europe who shared their samples with us because um, uh, the postdoc, Stephanie Kreutmeier, together with uh, the team, Susanne, Nico, Florian, Chiara, and Donatella and Sindhu and all these, all these folks here, they they thought it would be great to use our uh, um, high throughput workflow to immunophenotype them. By the time that we had the samples and could do these experiments, a lot of data were already published, starting initially, obviously, from China, but then also our colleagues in the US uh, uh, performed better and had lots of data already out there. So we knew the immune profile of, of COVID-19. But what we didn't know, and do not know today is how is that really different from other patients that have um, that are suffering from critical pneumonia so they're hospitalized because of uh, severe lung infection and so what we did is we got a cohort of COVID-19 patients and uh, with these different WHO grades and um, and here are the numbers essentially. Uh, so we had mild cases, we had severe cases, we had lots of clinical routine parameters that were introduced, but we also had a unique cohort and uh, clinically uh, with a very similar manifestation in many ways, which is hospital acquired pneumonia, where patients uh, do often due to trauma end up in an ICU and then because of the intubation for, for complicated reasons, will develop hospital acquired pneumonia, both viral and bacterial. And we thought this is a good group to identify not just what COVID immune profile looks like, but moreover and more importantly, what is the specific immune response to SARS-CoV-2? And so this was done and this was uh, used uh, numerous panels that were overlapping. So we get a good picture, uh, totally, uh, total of almost 200 samples that we had. And if you just look at the data, everything combined in this UMAP here, yeah, we see kind of interesting cells. We see monocytes, dendritic cells, NK cells, B cells, CD4, CD8s, and what have you. But we can go into more detail. Um, our dimensionality was sufficient to allow a detailed analysis of the myeloid compartment of these innate uh, natural killer cells of um, B cells, as well as the T cell compartment in, in, in pretty tight resolution, pretty good resolution that we had here. And now we can ask ourselves the question, how is that different in the different disease entities? Um, 
okay, so here on top of it, we had like all kinds of additional information. The first thing you see using a simple PCA is that healthy donors look fundament have a fundamentally different immune profile, even if the numbers of cells are equalized, a fundamentally different immune profile compared to patients with pneumonia, which is this big block here. But patients with, we can still distinguish mild, severe, and, um, and hospital acquired pneumonia. So this is the immune response specific to SARS-CoV-2, and this is an immune response that is specific to other pathogens that drive a very similar disease. And this image here does not show you cells, but specific features, features which are very specific to COVID, uh, uh, to severe COVID, but in common with this hospital acquired pneumonia. And here we have features which are only found in COVID and not in hospital acquired pneumonia. And um, again, in the interest of time, I will not go into all that much detail. I do desperately hope that this work will see the light of day at one point in the near future. Um, but we were really surprised on how many features are basically common just to the fact that you're hospitalized and intubated and, and, and sedated and, and getting oxygen, uh, as opposed to something that's very specific to SARS-CoV-2. But I still wanna share some unique features and only examples thereof. Um, so what we see uh, more pronounced in half patients is this, is this depression in uh, MHC expression across the myeloid compartment, but also of co-stimulatory molecules, which are basically more or less gone, strongly depressed in, in HAP, uh, more so even than in COVID. And uh, on the other hand, what we see is the NK and T cells or lymphocyte immune adaptation is much more pronounced uh, in immune response to SARS-CoV-2 than in immune response to than the overall malaise and, and, and uh, immunological changes that are observed in, in hospitalized patients with pneumonia. So just without going into much detail, we see this uh, rather dramatic depression in NKT cell, this strong upregulation in, 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 in PD-1, uh, changes in 38, and, and all kinds of other things. We see this depression of interferon gamma, for instance, here, which we thought was interesting. Um, there is also a little bit of information of GMCSF in there, which I will not go into today. Last slide I want to share with you before um, the end of this is essentially that even 14 weeks after these patients have been basically uh, have, have gone through COVID, there is still a long lasting impression on the immune signature, as you can see uh, in, in this, in this uh, feature uh, heat map, where we see clear differences long after the patient has had COVID in both the monocyte DC compartment as well as in the T and NK cell compartment throughout the study. B cells never popped up. We didn't see, I'm not saying there is nothing, but we've never seen anything in the B cell compartment here that would be uh, uh, of interest and or, or discerning features. With this, I'm basically at the end. This is an old picture from the team. We are all eager to take a new picture. As you can see, I didn't have a beard then. Uh, we are all very eager to, half of the people are no longer working. No, it's not quite true, but some of the people are no longer working there. We can't take a picture right now because it's difficult for us to all get together. Um, and with this, I, 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 I just made it as I promised you, Elena and Matteo, I just made it exactly in time. And uh, thank you very, very much for having me and thanks for listening to our work. Thank you, thank you, Bokar. This was terrific. Not, not only in time, but it was fascinating. Every single part of your talks. Thank you so much for sharing the, the published results, but also the new results that are still unpublished. We really appreciate it. So and we will encourage everyone to ask questions and uh, take the opportunity to interact with you in Twitter. And so uh, for Q&A, please go to the Count Global Immuno Talks, find the tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Burkhardt Becher here and reply to that tweet with your question and mentioning Global Immuno. And then Burkhardt would use the Count Better Lab uh, to answer the questions. And so, uh, even if you are watching afterwards in YouTube, uh, we encourage you to ask questions, student, postdocs, PI. So 
Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, another uh, last reminder, uh, next week uh, will be uh, the Global Immuno Speaker will be Gabriel Victor. So we hope to see you all uh, next week. So thank you, thank you, Bukhar, again. And thank you, everyone, for joining and Mateo for, for uh, co-hosting this, this Global Immuno Talk. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Ciao.